So for our final session, uh, we will uh, dive deeper into uh, impact and in particular local impact with our, with our next set of speakers. Uh, so I'm very happy to have contributions from uh, the other side of the globe, the Southern Hemisphere for this last session. Uh, so we'll have Kirsten uh, from CSIRO talking about the, uh, the initiatives that the CSIRO in Australia does in terms of uh, local community engagement. We will have Anton Biderman from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory talking about the framework uh, that they use for local um, engagement in South Africa. And we will also have uh, Raquel Velo um, talking about uh, the work that the um, South African uh, Council does on um, you know, frameworks on how to engage with local communities. So let's get started. And Kirsten, over to you. Kaya, Wonju, hello, welcome. I've come here today all the way from Australia, from the lands of the Wajak Noongar people. They're the traditional owners of Perth, Western Australia. And I'd like to begin my talk by acknowledging the traditional owners of all of the lands on which we host our facilities across Australia and pay my respect to their elders, both past and present. Australia's Indigenous people, our First Nations people, are our first scientists, and they have a long-standing knowledge of the universe in which we continue to build today. And I'd also like to pay my respect to all First Nations people here. So, who am I? Hi, I'm Kirsten. Thank you for the short introduction, Matt. I'm part of CSIRO's Space and Astronomy Communications team. I'm specifically responsible for communications for the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is the site where the SKO telescope is going to be built. And you've heard a lot about that already this week. So I'm very pleased to be here at headquarters and um, joining in with all my colleagues who've been working towards the SK for over a decade. But who are CSIRO? So we're Australia's national science agency, which means we are a government entity. We're kind of similar to the STFC or maybe the Max Planck Institutes in that we have very large distributed teams. We work across the entirety of Australia, across very many areas of science. And we take a really strong people first approach across our organization, which also flows into our communications. Um, we're also the SKO's operations partner for SKA Low in Australia. We have a lot of research infrastructure across Australia. Um, one of our main areas is actually managing this infrastructure for the research community in Australia. We have a lot of astronomy and space uh, sites that I'll be concentrating on today, but we also have disease research laboratories, a very large natural history collection, um, bushfire research facilities and things like that. Oh, and we also have a marine research vessel that tours around the Southern Ocean doing various research. So I'm going to concentrate on our space and astronomy infrastructure today. And here's an intro to what we have.
So as you can see, we have a lot of different things that we manage and we do. Um, this is a map of some of our space and astronomy sites across the country. Uh, so we're dealing with really large distances. Um, the width of Australia is about 3,000 kilometres or about 2,000 miles. Um, so we have really remote sites, very large area of land that we're dealing with. And we have a lot of different local communities. So some of our sites are really remote, others are metropolitan. So our local communities are very, very broad. Some of our example sites that you would have seen in the video is of course the MRO with our ASCAP radio telescope. The MRO is a closed site to protect its radio quiet. So in terms of local engagement there, we have open days approximately annually and we do media visits. We have the um, ATCA telescope, the Australia Telescope Compact Array in New South Wales that has a visitor centre that has about 15 to 20,000 annual visitors. We also have the Parks Radio Telescope, Mariang, that has a visitor centre as well that has about 100,000 annual visitors. We also manage two sites on behalf of NASA and ESA as ground tracking stations for space missions. And our Canberra site, the NASA um, Communications Complex, his, has a visitor centre as well that we manage, has about 70,000 annual visitors. And we're also partners in the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. You might have met Mark Stickles on Monday in his presentation with his best friend, the Quokka. Um, so we're a partner in Pawsey and Pawsey are going to be where the supercomputing infrastructure is, for, well, some of it, for SKLO, and they also process the data from the telescopes that are up the MRO currently. So to put that map in a European context, this is what Australia looks like over Europe. So our infrastructure is basically spread from Portugal to the Ukraine. That's what we're dealing with. So our local communities, um, we, as I said, very varied. I'm going to concentrate first on our traditional owners communities. Um, that's our uh, First Nations communities. So when I say engaging with First Nations, what does that look like in Australia? You might have seen this map before. This is a map of all of the Indigenous countries across Australia. There's over 300 different language groups and cultures. So it is not a cohesive um, one culture that we're dealing with with our Indigenous Australians. They are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and they have lots of different culture and, and practices that we work with. So we're, at each of our sites, we're actually dealing with a different traditional owner, a different First Nations community. One of our engagements that's happened recently is with our Parks Radio Telescope. The Parks Radio Telescope is 60 years old now, um, and a few years ago uh, it was gifted an Aboriginal name, Mariang, by the traditional owners of the site, the Wiradjuri people. <laughs> so the Wiradjuri, Wiradjuri people um, are the traditional owners of the site, and because Parks is now 60 years old, Engagement with our First Nations communities in Australia has changed a lot over the past 60 years. So Parks didn't start its life having had engagement with First Nations people, but we've worked really hard since then, particularly one of our astronomers, Dr. Stacey Maida, who is a Gidja man from Western Australia. He's been working really closely with the Wiradjuri people to work on um, bringing culture and connection into what we're doing at Parks. And after a many year process, it culminated in the gifting of Mariang as the, as the name for the Parks Telescope. And he, he is continuing to work with the local community on ongoing projects and to further that relationship. So a lot of things are in the works that I can't talk about, but it's looking really exciting. Another example is our ASCAP radio telescope and the MRO. So the traditional owners of this site are the Wadri Yamaji, the Wadri people um, in Western Australia. And for this site, our engagement actually started from day dot, really early on in the process of establishing this place as a radio astronomy observatory. We actually formed an Indigenous Land Use Agreement, or ILIWA, for the use of this site. This is a, a legal framework in Australia that you can use to have an, a, a very comprehensive legal agreement between the traditional owners and any other parties that want to use that land that's traditionally owned by that culture for a purpose. So we have an ILIO that was um, established in 2009 for the current MRO, and we're currently in negotiations for an expanded ILIO for the bigger MRO that will host the SKLO telescope. I have a lot that I can say about the ILIO, but I only have 15 minutes. So please come and talk to me afterwards. I'm more than happy to talk to you about the process. Um, but the basics are that the ILIO both 
um, looks at how we protect cultural heritage on the site, how we make sure that our activities don't um, damage cultural heritage, and then also provides benefits back to the local community. So both financial and um, societal benefits. Another uh, way that we have engaged with the Wadri community from the MRO is working with uh, Wadri artists. This is just one of many examples of the art projects that we have done with the Wadri community. Um, Shared Sky on the Wall Outside is another one that we've been involved in that was led by SKO. Um, this painting here is a representative commission of a research survey that was done using ASCAP called racks and it was commissioned by artist Ma from uh, Ma artist Margaret Whitehurst and this is what she says about her painting. My painting represents part of the universe being mapped from Wadri country. The symbols on the bottom right hand corner represent the Aboriginal people. The white boomerangs represent the ASCAP antenna dishes receiving the radio waves. There's the emu in the sky and black holes in my invisible universe. Also included is the Southern Cross and the Seven Sisters. So I don't know if you can spot the emu in the sky or the Southern Cross there or the Seven Sisters. That big round thing in the top left is the black hole. I particularly enjoy how she's represented that as kept dishes down in the bottom right. So this is, as I said, just one example of the many art projects. Um, this is gifted as a, a very prestigious um, gift to international um, uh, delegates and, and things like that by our CEO. Uh, the prints of this, we've also used it in a lot of different merchandise and things like that in our reports. So it's been seen by a very wide international audience. And uh, Margaret um, receives a copy of everything we produce with her art. And she's actually received a number of commissions since she produced this art, including her artwork on the side of what the biggest supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere, Satonics at the Pawsey Centre. So that's very brief rundown of our engagement with local um, traditional owners, a little bit about our engagement with the other local communities around our sites. So we've done a lot of different activities, but a few examples of really successful ones are we hold astrophotography nights at some of our iconic sites. Um, they're booked out months in advance, and this is one of the resulting images from those astrophotography nights. We also engage with community festivals that are already happening in the local community, such as the Parks Elvis Festival, that attracts 20,000 people each year. Uh, and the Parks Radio Telescope is a big part of that festival. Um, never would have thought you'd have Elvis at a radio telescope, telescope site, but we do. Uh, we also um, work in with uh, current events and things like that. So in um, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings, we had a very large suite of events and campaign around them to celebrate Australia's role in the moon landings. So NASA's Honeysuckle Creek um, tracking station and the Parkes radio telescope were actually part of the network that collected the first images from the moon landings. So we had about, oh, I think 20,000 people join us for just one day um, celebrating, sorry, one weekend celebrating the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. And we also work in with other national events and commemorative days. Um, this photo shows the parks dish lit in orange to celebrate our emergency volunteers during Australia's Volunteer Week, where a lot of iconic buildings around Australia were lit orange, and so we included parks in that. So we have over 70 years experience of engaging the local community with our infrastructure sites. Over that time, we've had a lot of impact, so I'm just going to Give you a few examples of some of the outcomes of our engagement and communications, particularly um, some of our infrastructure, namely Parks Murrayang. He's a cultural icon in Australia now. It was included on a chocolate bar recently um, by Cadbury. They were celebrating the last 100 years of them making chocolate in Australia and they chose Parks to represent the decade of the 1960s. It also it has a feature film purely about it filmed at the dish at the, at the Parks Radio Telescope, worth looking at if you like a good Australian classic film. We also have our beautiful imagery that gets featured on journal covers. So really high impact. And we have 150,000 annual visitors to our astronomy sites, which when the entire population of Australia is about 20 something million people, we're talking with a lot less population than European countries, but we still managed to get 150,000 visitors through our locations. And finally, I, you might, cast your mind back to Phil Diamond's welcome on Monday. He mentioned that uh, Wi-Fi was an outcome from radio astronomy. I'd like to just point out that's actually one of the major impacts from CSIRO's radio astronomy. 
fast Wi-Fi was invented by CSIRO radio engineers. And so we're going to take that to the bank pretty much forever, I think, because it's one of the major outcomes of our science and, and our infrastructure. Now, finally, I think I'm just about have time for this. Um, if you go to slido.com and type in that code, you can join in and give me a vote for what your favourite piece of footage from our infrastructure is. And as I'm finishing up, I just wanted to say basically the the success in our communications practices from our perspective is our strengths of our visuals. So I shared the video at the start to introduce our infrastructure rather than talking about it because I think radio telescopes are about the most beautiful pieces of infrastructure on the planet. I'm not biased at all, obviously. And um, we put a lot of effort and a lot of energy into making sure that we have really beautiful vision from our sites to use and promote them. And I also think that our people first approach, which I haven't been able to talk about much today, is also a really big strength in our communications. So here's the grid of the things. <laughs> I've got eight seconds more according to my timer. Drop me a vote. Tell me what your favourite is. I have a very strong favourite myself, so I'm interested to see what everyone else thinks. <laughs> We've got a few votes coming in. I'll give it a few more minutes with, oh, sorry, a few more seconds with the grid. Can you give them more time to vote during the yeah. next talks? Yeah, I can leave the voting open, but I'll, I'll reveal what the votes are already. Well, it looks well. like Parks has won so far. <laughs> I won't tell you what my favorite is until later on <laughs> in the Slack. I'll right, we'll leave the vote open. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Now we will have uh, Anton Binneman. Yeah, I'm on the Are link. Um, I should just be able to share my screen. So John is a panelist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Share my screen. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anton Binneman. I'm currently the, the, the communications and science engagement manager at Sarayo. Previously, I was the was the stakeholder manager working a lot with local communities and what's happened in local communities. I've quite a bit of stuff to get through, so I'm not going to bore you with, with all the detail, but I'll make my presentation available and, and you can ask questions on that. Just in terms of, of the outline, uh, the idea is basically to share how we got to our stakeholder and now the science engagement framework. A lot of it is based on data, it's based on walking uh, the path basically with the SKO. So Matteo was crucial in this, the SKO was crucial in this, and there's constant thinking about how do we do and how do you best engage communities. Um, this is just the NRF in South Africa is very similar to the CSRO with lots of research infrastructure ranging, ranging from uh, paleontology all the way up to astronomy. So, so covering all basic scientists essentially. So um, getting to a framework, I'm very set on data, uh, getting and using data to inform what we do as, as an organization within these communities. Uh, in, in this talk, I'm gonna refer to two basic sources social media and academic publications from a specific journal. So um, very quickly, the impact, my colleagues have spoken, Bonita has spoken to impact and some people have spoken to impact, but the impact of a project like the SKO in its totality on a country like South Africa is immense. Um, we're currently busy, procure, we procured a study and we're gonna do field work in a couple of weeks on 
the complete uh, um, benefit to South Africa up until this point. And we're also going to project in terms of economic um, economic projections what we can expect going forward. But up to now, you can see in terms of local beneficiation, 160 million odd rand has been spent in local communities. Communities that would have otherwise been dead. Um, so, so if you take a similar town to Carnarvon, which is the town we use as entry point to the SKA site, uh, similar towns in South Africa with a similar makeup is showing economic decline by, by large supermarket groups and people doing the research in South Africa. Carnarvon is having an uptick. Um, we currently expanded on, on Meerkat with an additional 20 dishes that will, it's a collaboration between the Italians, Max Planck and South Africa. That's having a very big impact in Carnarvon with projects like Yera, et cetera. So, so again, if you have the, the presentation, you're welcome to go through that. There is negative impact. If you, if you build a radio telescope in a community like that, there's, we had to buy land, 130,000 hectares, which gives you about 16 million rand worth of impact. There's visual pollution, there's an impact on telecommunications, there's an impact on flight routes, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of impact. And then there's the disruptive change. So if you take a community like Canova and its people, who have been hardened by that, by the environment as a whole. It's not people who like to change. So, um, and this is disruptive in a sense. Very quickly, in terms of the framework, and I've presented this a couple of times before, is we start, our, as Sereo, our take is we start on the outside of this circle with local communities, individuals, uh, the, this is the first, um, I, I want to use um, a colleagues from Lofar's example, the first, gener the first population that we're dealing with. It's the man on the street, it's the local farmers, it's local communities, it's the local San indigenous people, it's the local Khoi indigenous people, it's uh, the local council. It's, uh, so, so there's a lot of local people involved that we work with and we engage with them and there's a there's a key here that you'll be able to see and then we move in up to a point where we get to the national and the global populations so the SKA is a partner um, a national government is a partner so example with the San Council which is one of the indigenous groups that we deal with is in the communities the San descendants that we work with directly then there's, there's leadership that lies on a provincial level called the San Council. And then there's the National Khoi San Council. And then we're also cognitive of what our colleagues at the CSIRO is doing um, in terms of the Ilawas and uh, etc. So, so we deal with all these communities and there's a very specific reason why we're doing this. Um, and we, how we got to this. So how we got to, and science engagement functions at the same level. Our first priority, like with National Science Week coming up, is on the outside perimeter. We, we're working with local communities, informing them on how radio astronomy works, how astronomy works, how things are, are put together. And then we're working with provincial authorities in the broader NRF. National National Science Week is covering all sciences and also astronomy. And then obviously global is part of what we're doing now and with the CAP conference and with PCST and all the other mentioned conferences. To get to this, we, what I like to do is to use what data is available. Um, what are the things that we can look at? And what is the model that you analyze this with? I like Habermas. Someone else would like um, uh, the theory of change or systems theory or, or Lumen or whoever. 
the reason why I use this is because it gives me a framework to work with information that I get from the communities, from academic publications, and from social media. When I joined the organization, the SKA was the common enemy in local communities. And we had to figure out why is this the case? What's underlying this? And a model similar to this one got us to a point where we understood land land issues was was what what drove this discussion so critical discourse analysis is you're looking at the narratives you're looking at the stories you're looking at uh, at framework set out by this is adapted from Habermas, and i used um a couple of colleagues eric jensen from the uk gave some input onto this model and and how it was used so everything, all data, all communication received from communities is tested. Is it comprehensible? Is it true? Is it legitimate? Is there sincerity linked to it? And then there's distortions linked to that. So, um, and I'm going to use an example. At one point, there was a journal focused on the SKA and its work in, in South Africa. And I'll get to the strategic stuff around that now. And if you looked at some of the academic information, the worst possible thing that could happen to the world and to South Africa is if the SKA is constructed. Working in these communities and understanding what fundamental impact this project has on a country and communities surrounding the site, I knew it wasn't true, but you can't, in an academic context, stand up and say, no, this is not true. You need to have a model and you need to have academic legitimacy linked to it. So these articles were evaluated. This is a, an example of what the analysis would look like in, in Excel. From there, we worked uh, to, to looking at what is the academic claims made. Um, and I'll use the SKA one. The SKA say, says that the site is in the middle of nowhere and there's no one. It's a desert space rather than a social space. And I knew this was nonsense because we were working in these communities. So, so what do you do with this? The project had, the, the fact was that the project had a local stakeholder manager since inception, um, including people, negotiating with communities, doing the artwork that we're doing. Um, so, just one back. So, so the project is not lying. So the distortion is that, it, that the project is lying. And then you can look the last one, establishment of an astronomy reserve in the core site of the SK Rotary telescopes marks the beginning of an epochal shift away from commercial sheep farming in the upper Karoo. I mentioned to someone this morning that we work with data. So we know how many sheep is in the Karoo, exactly. We, we know what the impact economically will be because the GDP calculations was made. Um, and that specific area contributes very little. When I joined the SKA, it hadn't rained a single drop in a lot of those communities for seven years. So in terms of, of contribution to the broader GDP, it was actually very small. Um, the distortion, all local farming will cease to happen which isn't true. So, so they're still going and they're still producing really good quality lamb and lamb products. So Dolce and Cabana, uh, you're all probably familiar with that. A lot of this leather that they use is from the SKA site and surrounding the SKA site. Lamb products, top quality lamb products also still comes from this area. So um, other distortions, the bulk of the population in the area are thumb descendants which is not true either. You have a lot of indigenous communities. Similar to the Australian colleagues, the perception is sometimes that you have a homogeneous group within the Northern Cape, which is also a really big area, which is not true. There's about seven different indigenous groupings that you'll find in that area. Um, so uh, you'll be able to see the rest of the, the comments that's been made in that. I wanna show this, this is what we got when we, when I joined the organization. This was a, a church service, which also tells you a little bit about this religious op opposition towards what the SKA and CERN and some of these organizations are doing. 
so the local church had services where they said that the SKA is evil. So, so SKA NDE. So SKA is obviously SKA, and if you add NDE, it means shame in Afrikaans, skande. Uh, and the whole church service was pushed around this, and we had to demystify this. So, so constantly in our engagement projects and, and engagements in the local community, we had to explain, no, 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 this is not the case. This is how engagement happened. So, so this is just a good example of some of the distortions that were informed by social media and social media analysis. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, uh, two minutes. So, so in terms of Facebook posts, again, you'll be able to see it. It was, it was quite, um, it was, it was quite difficult. Um, key findings. Let me get to to, to strategic communications. All of these things had to be dealt with. In terms of the, the first framework that I showed you, we dealt with it in the following way. So Dr. Bernie Fanerov, who was one of the people who spearheaded the SKA in South Africa, and Matteo attended um, conferences and webinars held to engage with this material and the scientists directly. I'm um, stating, listen, you guys, I have the facts incorrectly uh, and having an academic conversation around that. Um, we in collaboration with academic partners, we, we deal with these things uh, constantly and we're busy with a socioeconomic survey linked to a perception survey so that we can give the SKA a good source of, of where we are at and where we are going. So. So in terms of, of science engagement, we try to follow the same pattern, starting locally, dealing with misconceptions in the communities, ensuring that the science is properly communicated. If people have, if people understand the science and understand the instrument, it's much easier for them to, to take ownership of a project like this. And we're starting to see this. Publications talking about SKA and Carnarvon being the gateway to the greatest science project, project ever committed by mankind. So any questions, anything that you want to have a chat about, I'll still be around and we'll take online questions. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you very much, Antoine. As you can see, even astronomy is not immune to uh, sensitive uh, topics. And uh, thank you to Anton for the, the work that he does with local community engagement, which is super important and uh, at the core face of communications. Uh, just on the, 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 the anecdote about the DSK site being in a desert, um, I sat in a, in a meeting with, with stakeholders where um, you know, they, they mentioned that that was an issue. Uh, and we thought, well, where, where are we saying this? And it was on the SK website and it was a page that we'd not updated in years that had been written 10 years ago, where it said that the SK site is on a desert. Uh, and that page was taken at face value and was saying, well, look, you know, the SK says that it's a desert and it's not. And um, so, you know, it goes to show that your communications is extremely important and to make sure that your resources, public resources are up to date. So that was, a, that was a good lesson learned. Okay, thank you very much. That's actually a really good segue to our last uh, talk. So Raquel is standing in for uh, Michael to deliver this, uh, this final talk. Uh, Raquel, can I check that you're, uh, you're online and your sound works? Yes, hi, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, let me try and uh, go ahead and share my screen. Um, it's been a while since a, I did a Zoom presentation as it's summer here in, in the U.S., so you can all imagine um, that it always takes a second to transition. Yeah. Thank you also to Raquel for standing in for Michael, who's unavail unavailable to deliver the talk. And it's uh, Raquel is in New York, so it's fairly early still over there. Yes. I'm nursing my coffee as I do this, um, but thank you all for allowing me to step in. Um, so, of course, as I'm not Michael, um, as you can see, I 
I'm actually going to take a slightly different approach to presenting than perhaps he might have or that we might have done had we presented together. So this is a project that I'll be presenting a little bit more from my perspective. So for a little bit more of an introduction, I'm an assistant professor on the tenure track um, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm in the Department of Science and Technology Studies. So I'm really very interested at the moment in, and historically my research interests have always been infrastructures. In particular, um, I've been fascinated by how infrastructures impact marginalized communities, but especially how marginalized communities shape infrastructures in turn through their interactions with infrastructures. So as I um, am ending my tenure track and I'm putting together my tenure portfolio, of course, a few things happen at that moment. One is a pretty significant emphasis placed on the writing of a book, which I'm currently uh, wrapping up, which is uh, provisionally titled Experiencing Infrastructures uh, with University of Washington Press. But a few years ago, I went to visit San Pedro de Atacama in Chile. Um, and with my mother, we ended up visiting the Alma headquarters. The image you have in front of you is actually of uh, my previous bedroom. I had this image um, of one of the satellites of the array just hanging over my bed. This has kind of haunted my life for a few years now. And it's just become, I think I would probably say a bit of an obsession. Um, it expanded as an obsession, my fascination with research infrastructures when Arecibo in Puerto Rico collapsed in December of 2020. In fact, I wrote a piece for the conversation on the topic um, on the global divide in funding and science, as I talked about it there. Um, if you're interested, um, I, I would suggest you have a look at that. But really what this spurred is a firm acceptance that research infrastructures and especially astronomy research infrastructures are going to become a new topic of interest. And the bigger picture, as soon as we started looking as, at astronomy in place is that not a lot of focus has been given to moments of tension in the building of astronomy facilities. And this was something that was really interesting to me is that there is minimal research in science and technology studies and histories of science that really treat the building of astronomy facilities as moments of friction. We have this case with the Mauna Kea Observatory, um, the building of the 30 meter telescope and the debate with indigenous uh, rights activists there at the sacred lands of Mauna Kea. We see that with SKA and land rights that was just pointed out by Anton, including questions of telecommunications, disruption does cause discomfort. And Arecibo Observatory, once it collapsed, such intense mourning that came out of the community showing the support that Arecibo had actually garnered for the community, which is actually the, the kind of mirror image of that is that we have frictions and then we have this other type of friction at the end of a life cycle, if in, in uh, infrastructure has garnered support, which is, well, how are you going to replace it now? Because we are missing an integral part of our social fabric. And then lastly, I just want to point out Atacama Astronomical Park, which I use as this catch-all. I know that it doesn't really just speak to Alma. Alma is a separate thing. Atacama Astronomical Park has all of these other facilities surrounding it. But in the building of Alma, there were actually 17-day uh, labor strikes that occurred that are not that often spoken about, um, again, in history of science and STS. It was mentioned in Science News by a couple of reporters. Um, but again, nobody really seems to want to dig very deeply into that. And I, I thought in, in conversations with, with Michael, we kind of started seeing this pattern and wanted to investigate it a little bit further. So we have this project in vision to investigate the interactions between research infrastructures and the localities upon which they are built. The overarching research question is, how does the hosting of large research infrastructures actually co-construct the locality and the research infrastructure? How does that interaction shape both sides of that puzzle? Both the society, the local community that's hosting it, as well as the research infrastructure itself, and the forms of community engagement, the forms of inter interactions that they have with community, and also the type of science that's done within it. So full disclosure, I'm currently, as I've mentioned, in a bit of a messy place. I have a lot of field sites that fascinate me. I have too little time this year with the book, and I'm still trying to get this kind of up and running. But I started off with this focus on Antofagasta region and the astronomy cluster that's developing in the Atacama Desert. We know that astronomy in Chile has a history of transnationalism, significantly with funding from the USA and Europe. 
I've mentioned um, that the development of ALMA was this um, uh, collaborative endeavor between the US, Europe, Japan with Chile ceding the land, but there's also these labor disputes that occurred in 2013. There are various sites that are still in the process of being built and three have already been approved. Um, and Antofagasta is historically a mining region. Um, although fast, in a fascinating turn of events, even the regional planning um, documents now are starting to speak of the astronomy industry as something that they're looking to for the development of the region. It also claims a significant partnership with the Takamenu indigenous communities. There's a little bit less evidence of that. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a second. Uh, so the first thing that we're trying to do at the moment is to build a conceptual analytical framework that really attempts to grapple with all of these um, different questions around infrastructures and engagement, um, especially from the perspective of science and technology studies and histories of science. Now, I, I wanna emphasize that because this isn't a classic social, um, social impact assessment research. This is not what we're aiming for. This isn't a research assessment framework that we're trying to do. It really is a qualitative um, analytical framework, theoretical analytical framework. So we're trying to partner some of the good stuff that came out of social impact assessment literature from the managing of social issues associated with planned interventions. But one of the things that has kind of um, been the focus in a lot of that research has been a concern for return on public investment. Now, this is a little bit complicated in the concept, in the, in the context of local communities in the global south, especially when the funding has been provided by the global north. So the Techno, uh, Technopolis Group um, 2020 publication that I'm citing here was uh, a research on uh, return on public investment of the UK in its funding of CERN which is great that they're doing that. But if we were to do something like that in the context of ALMA, say the NSF is trying to do a return on public investment for the US in the context of ALMA, it wouldn't tell us very much about what's actually happening on the ground in Chile for the local communities. And that's really what we're trying to get to. So for that, Methodologically, big science histories is offering us a little bit more. It accepts, for example, the question that um, big science is dependent on a heterogeneous system, right? It's dependent on various operations at various scales, um, local, um, regional, and global, and all of these interactions being done at the site of infrastructures, at the site of these facilities. But more importantly, Big science, big science histories have often been a little bit internalist. They've often been about, okay, this was um, why the choice was made for building CERN on this particular site, but then it kind of studies the bricks and mortar of that site and the relationships of scientists within that site. It doesn't do a whole bunch of that tendrilling out of how that infrastructure impacts the local community. So we're really interested in that. And for that, I'm building in um, infrastructure studies. Um, it picks up from the bricks and mortar histories, but what it's trying to do is to strip back that mundane character of infrastructure to reveal all of the various consequences for various types of users, not just one exclusive user. So I don't understand user of these facilities as being only the community of astronomers or astrophysicists or planetary scientists. I'm really speaking about users, including the technicians, including the um, cleaning crew, the maintenance crew, including cafeteria workers, all of these become users of that infrastructure, as well as the visitors that come in through the visitor center, et cetera. Infrastructure studies also allows for a multi-scalar approach, which really allows us to account for things that are happening at the place but also allows us to um, study that question of global transnational relations. As I mentioned in the case of Alma, if we have this funding that's coming from the global north, but at a facility that's being hosted in the global south, we need to be able to account for these disparities as well and these um, differences in how the money is flowing. And this, I think, is one of the fascinating things about this conceptual framework is that it tries to assist in the north-south division that exists currently in infrastructure studies. It's very, very focused right now 
in talking about infrastructures of the global north versus infrastructures of the global south as though they were super different. And my uh, understanding of infrastructures right now is that not really. Infrastructures really are just a question of maintenance and having money that helps them be maintained. And in the, and in the uh, space of Alma, when that money is coming from abroad, it becomes a lot less of a concern. Um, and really arguably that infrastructure becomes an infrastructure of the global north, despite it being cited in the south. I'll just mention also that we're bringing in Latin American STS. I'm Brazilian, I've worked with Latin American STS for a very long time. But one of the things that's significant in, in Latin American STS is that it includes within it a, a, an all, almost um, innate critique of transnational North-South collaborations. Now, I think at times that that's a little bit problematic and a little bit simplified, but in broad, broad terms, what Pablo Kreimer, um, an Argentinian STSer, has said is that when there is a North-South collaboration in scientific projects, the vast majority of times, Global South scientists are relegated to doing the less prestigious types of work, whereas Global North scientists are often doing highly theoretical, highly innovative types of work. And this has tracked in a whole bunch of different replication of these studies or, or similar case studies show um, the same type of, um, of dynamic existing in, in different North-South collaborations. What, what's more interesting to me in terms of Latin American STS is that there is an acceptance in, in the work of Varsavsky and Dagonino that there is a non-innocence of science and its social responsibilities. And by that, I don't mean in terms of, oh, uh, if you're doing science, you have a responsibility to do public engagement of, or, of your science. What they're speaking about really is about, um, about the engagement with the agenda of science for, um, Varsavsky's Ciencia Nueva, or New Science, one of the things he speaks about is how agenda setting in um, scientific institutions ought to be dictated by the needs of society. So that means a constant back and forth with stakeholders, local stakeholders, about what their needs are to understand the direction that research ought to be taking. So engaging with that type of, of literature does kind of help us ask the question of what is the work that is being done in these institutions and to what extent does it meet the um, pressing social needs of the locality in which these facilities are embedded. So I'll, I'll just kind of put that framework aside as we haven't really applied it. Um, we have a, a, a publication that's currently under review with Michael. We hope that it'll come out by the end of the year, but since writing that publication with, with Michael, we've started um, each in, on our own side kind of working on a project that has these uh, basic conceptual frameworks. And I have become more and more sunk into the Arecibo question. I recently came into communication with an Arecibo astronomer. Um, not only were they incredibly welcoming and having a back and forth about Arecibo, but they actually invited me to present at a conference, um, at a planetary sciences conferences, conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility back in April. And after presenting, we had a bit of a back and forth on this. And this is something that they sent to me in an email that they allowed me to, to show that is, when we enter communities to use their land and local resources to create ground-based facilities, we also enter into a sort of social contract with that community. The facility becomes part of the community through science, public engagement, through economic ties and more. When we abandon these facilities without thought, we break our part of that social contract that causes pain and hurt to the community and that should be considered whenever funding agencies move to defund facilities. So part of the reason why I thought this was such an important communication for me and for the, the um, continuation of my personal project um, moving forward, which I will be focusing on Arecibo, is the question of life cycles of these facilities. Um, I think a lot of people that have presented right now are working in functioning facilities with funding that's coming in and of course, we can talk about the nuances of funding and astronomy that are also hyper complex. But one of the things that is not truly studied is how this social contract with the community is established. How is it done well? When is it not done well? 
What are the nuances that really um, provide a better understanding for how to do, not just better, again, public relations, public communication, but how to really invest in a community when you are there? What does it mean to invite people in to have conversations about what your facility is doing on the land that they have known as their home for a very long time? And then 50, 60 years down the line, after, in the case of Arecibo, over 20, 25 years of questionable funding streams for the maintenance, what does it mean for that facility to, in almost, I mean, I, I almost want to use the word abandon in the case of Arecibo. I know some people would probably bristle at that, but it's been 20 years of really complex funding streams for Arecibo to be kept alive. So I think that these questions of the evolution of that social contract with these facilities needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. Um, so this is the shift that I find myself in is to do and place this emphasis on the social contract, how the use of community benefits originally helps prop up a lot of these projects, but are then forgotten when these facilities close shop. Um, the closing of Arecibo was also um, a long time coming in no small part because of the funding of ALMA, it, at least in the context of the National Science Foundation. The 2006 um, report, um, a senior review panel of astronomers basically said we need to shut Arecibo or Arecibo needs to find alternative funding streams for NSF to be able to fund ALMA. Um, so I think there's an, an interesting uh, potential uh, adjacent study to be done around these choices of what happens when you divest in one, reinvest in the other, and what it means for the social contracts locally in each case. Um, the Life Cycles uh, project really wants to have both an internalist and externalist emphasis. Um, with this, um, there's now a, a, a fascinating trend on transnational work and particularly on extractive data practices of astronomy facilities. I'm happy to provide um, any references that people might like on that. Sebastian Lejuede, who's a Chilean who has worked um, at the ALMA uh, or done research on the ALMA speaks a lot about that and has a fantastic article on that. Okay. Um, current status, um, I'm submitting a proposal to the NSF. I submitted one last year um, that was this close to getting accepted. I'm reworking it and resubmitting it in three weeks. Um, and I'm currently working with Michael Gaff um, on a, a team project um, that's an extensive literature review on astronomy facilities in their local communities with a particular emphasis on facilities in the global south. Um, I, I can probably advance um, some of the findings, which is we have not found a lot of work on that. Um, so if anybody has any references that they might be willing to share on that for us to add to the literature review, please let me know. But otherwise, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Raquel. Thank you for this uh, insight into your, your research. And I think it's... Um, it's a nice way to um, to wrap up these discussions, actually, and to trigger some some thinking around the the impact of research infrastructures. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, we are 15 minutes over time here, uh, so I will take an executive decision and direct two questions to our speakers, and I will ask for very short answers. Uh, so, to Anton and. Kirsten first. We, we've talked about, uh, well, just now about the social contract with local communities, uh, and you've touched upon uh, the benefits flowing to communities. How do you reconcile um, the differences between um, ensuring local benefits to communities around the research infrastructures and benefits flowing at the national level? I know it's a very hard question. I do apologize. Uh, but I will ask for short answers. Anton? <laughs> so in terms of the South African context, um, although there's a lot of money flowing into local communities, the SKA, the SKA specifically is much too big for only the local communities to benefit. So in terms of the direct construction, there's already a national impact and an impact on foreign direct investment. The other thing is that in terms of the South African, the reason, one of the reasons for hosting the SKA 
is to move away from a mineral-based economy into a knowledge economy. 10, 20 years back, there was about 10, 10 15 um, radio astronomers in the country and data scientists almost, almost didn't exist. And in forming this knowledge economy, the broader country is benefiting in terms of people being upskilled, um, uh, people applying these skills in other fields. So, so there's different benefits to the country, but a large part is linked to the, the national development plan um, that's currently being implemented in, the, implemented in the country and the work that the Department of Science Innovation is doing in general. So that would be the simple answer. It's much more complicated. Thank you. Yeah, we can um, direct the conversation to Slack if there's any, uh, you know, if people want to carry on the, the discussion. Uh, Kirsten, briefly on that. Uh, very much seconding everything Anton has said. It's it's very similar in Australia, diverse, diversifying the Western Australian economy away from mining um, towards knowledge. Radio astronomy has really boomed the last decade in the state. Um, there's a lot of wider educational benefits in Australia, similar to, similarly to South Africa, and we're seeing SK contracts flow across the entire country, not just locally. So the SK observatory is is not just local impact. Local impact is quite large and as it should be in my opinion, but it is national as well in Australia. Okay, thank you. And I've got one final question that I will direct to, uh, I've got Lynn online uh, and Maria and to Tabia as well afterwards. Um, well, well, I can see the focus we've got that you know our teams, particularly communications teams, increasing on talking about the wider impact of our research infrastructures, um, as opposed to talking about the science of our research infrastructures. And we are dedicated more and more resource to talking about this wider um, impact for for the, you know very obvious reasons. Uh, so I will address the question to Anna Lynn first. Uh, do you feel like talking about the wider impact of research infrastructures is becoming more important than talking about the science of research infrastructures? Again, I apologize for the difficult question. Yeah, that's a difficult one indeed. I would definitely not say it's more important, but I think it is important. And it's something that in the past, um, organizations like ours have probably done less of, and that's why there is a gap now that we're addressing. So I feel it's very, very important. Having said that science is what we're there for, and it should be our priority, if you want my opinion. Thank you. Maria, did you want to add anything to that from ESO? No, not really needed. It's um, something very important to keep on, as Anneli mentioned, to keep on uh, using science as a career of our messages because uh, specifically in the case of astronomy it's very easy to spark the attention of the audiences and using this to promote also many other messages that we want to uh, to send to our audiences for our broader societal impact okay thank you and i will turn this question to tabia to wrap up so I think all the presentations today in the last two sessions specifically have highlighted the importance about, you know, driving behavioral change through science and through the communications in the research infrastructure. So I hope we can come home uh, with, you know, a lot of ideas and inspire each other and uh, continue to drive and push for these ideas. Thank you. Absolutely. And yes, I'm sorry we've had to um, rush through a very dense program this morning, but hopefully it triggered a lot of thinking uh, and it's also an opportunity to build connections and networks for those conversations to uh, to carry on offline so we do have to wrap it up uh, because we are quite over time so i would like to thank all of our speakers from this morning again one final clap